two, one, and we're live. The damn good day show. The one and only Freddie City is on the building. What's up, man? How are you? What's going on, man? It's happening. You're here. You're in the house. I've been wanting to do this for all, like get you on the show, pick your brain, and it's happening. So I'm so so excited, dude. I'm excited for you. Your show's getting get better. Your cigars are getting better. Everything's going well. You know, taking it step by step, trying to surround myself with amazing, interesting people, and good things are happening. That's, that's kind of the vibe of Miami right now, right? It's kind of good things happening. So. When I think about the vibe of Miami, you show you come up in my head. Like you have so much Miami energy. I've had Miami energy, yeah. So like people, people say, "Oh, what's going on with Miami?" It's like for me, Miami's always been great. Um, I think people are just starting to realize it now. Obviously, it changes when more and more people come. Economies grow, more opportunities, and it, it allows other people to come. Um, but for me, as far as business creation environment, I've always enjoyed it. One thing I, I got to commend you and, and thank you. So we met at Augusto's dinner. Shout out Augusto. I met so many people at that, that dinner. There was just a lot of good people. And uh, we hit it off instantly, Insta boys. And then you were like, hey, are you, are you going to be at a merge conference? I'm like, what, what the fuck's a merge conference? <laughs> and you're like, dude use this code and you hooked me up and you got me a VIP ticket to the Emerge conference starting the next day. And I went and again, I met the most incredible people. I mean, that conference was life changing. I, and I just want to say like, thank you so much for doing that. That was so cool of you. We had just met and you just instantly added value to my life. And I just want to say thank you. Like that was such an awesome experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's really Miami's special conference right now. And a lot of things have spawned off of that like kind of like uh, if you look at art basil it was kind of like that it started one thing and now it spawned into a huge art global thing um emerge is kind of like that now you have tech week you have, now you have bitcoin conference you have uh, other conferences and it just starts um and it all kind of surrounds the that emerge conference yeah the emerge great people there it was it was pretty cool did you but it was the app it was the mingling that i got most value out of in my opinion i mean that's that's most conferences regardless um but they got great speakers they do great setups and and uh yeah hats you know hats off to them you know they COVID obviously affected them for two years and and they came back strong came back strong i remember i was i I saw you at the after party i was like ready what's up and you're like i was sitting we were talking for like uh, a minute and you're like so you meeting anyone? And I was like, ah, oh, shit. You just put me on the spot. I was like, I gotta go, gotta go. I love that in people. People that just push you to just do better, right? And constantly network and learn and, and grow. Because it's, we used to play this game. And I mean, I guess you still play it from time to time. But it was more so for talking to girls, right? And the idea is that you have to set up your friend for the best scenario to speak to a girl because naturally as a dude, you're overthinking yourself 24 seven. Like, oh, what's she gonna say? What's going on? So how the game would work is if myself and you were going out to a bar or whatever, and I saw you know an attractive someone that I think you might be interested in, I could say, hey, Freddie, you have to go introduce yourself to that person right now. And if you don't just stop what you're doing and walk over and say something, then you have to buy everyone a round of drinks. And the idea is that it forces you outside of your comfort zone and it forces you to be, you know, just put yourself out there. And then the boys sweep in as reinforcements. That whole thing trains your brain to just meet people and prospecting for business and relationships and anything. And I seriously think it's one of the biggest life hacks besides podcasting. It's It sounds like a good game. We could also do a variation, right, where you go to the bar and I see someone that I'm interested. In. Now you have to convince her to come have a drink with me. To make it even more challenging. Damn, that's the Una reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Reverso. Listen, yeah, that would be that would be a good role play right there. Because <laughs> now it takes more for you to convince the girl to come over to hang out with me or have a drink with me. And why is she interested in your friend? Right, and then all of a sudden she's interested in you, and she's just like, "Why is this this guy trying to get me to talk to his friend when I want to talk to him?" You might have to reverse or reverse it. Yeah, the, the <laughs> double reverse. You might be ordering two drinks. And, and you've been having, the, you've had a crazy life as an entrepreneur. And I've also just noticed that you're really well in the know about what's happening, whether it be conferences, whether it be what's, you're just in the know. You're very aware, but you also have that 
the socialness to be able to to jump around different groups of people. And I think we're sort of similar in that way. I wouldn't put myself in the same bucket as you, but you're like a social butterfly that's always down to learn. You know, the world is small. I've lived in, you know, three continents. I was born in Brazil. I speak four languages. Um, you end up meeting people um, all the time. Um, today I had lunch with a kid I went to high school with in Switzerland. And tonight I'm having dinner with a friend I went to with Harvard. And, you know, those social circles seem to always come back to Miami, come back to New York. I, you know, you could be in Paris, you could be in Dubai. You're going to meet people you know. And they're usually going to be a connected group. And, and, you know, kind of back to what you're saying, that good energy feeds good energy. Um, you know, I've done six startups, essentially all different. And, um, and so you start learning a lot of things. You were born in Brazil. I was born in Rio de Janeiro. Damn, that explains it. Wow. Yeah. How old were you when you moved? Um, so I never lived in Brazil. When I was one, I moved to London. And then I lived in London until I was about six. Moved to Dallas. Went to Switzerland when I was 15. Moved to... Uh, Why'd you go to Switzerland? Uh, well, apparently it's the best high schools. And my dad had an office there. And so he wanted me to come there. So he bribed me to come over and... And then uh, I was living in the south of France for a year after that, and then um, came to Miami again, uh, undergrad, lived in Miami, uh, now now going on 25 years. But I left, I lived in Boston, I came back, I lived in New York, I came back, I lived in Spain, I came back. Uh, so always came back to Miami, but I've had a base here for about 25 years, so I'm well rooted in Miami. I'm not you know, kind of that new transient that's that the wave, so to speak, the, the COVID wave or the, the, you know, I don't know what the tech boom wave and you want to call it, but it's definitely a wave of new people, uh, exciting, mostly good energy people. Uh, I think, I think it's amazing. Obviously prices are getting jacked up, but that's the world when good people come. Yeah. Yeah. I say it's expensive, but it's worth it. I mean, I mean <laughs> yeah. and it's the way it should be. Like, I don't know why it's such a surprise. Like Florida in general is such a gem right i mean when you think about beautiful beaches the best beaches are in california in my opinion like san diego has the most beautiful beaches like la jolla and like that area okay the water isn't as good though like the water is nasty in my opinion i yeah i relate i relate the best beaches to the best water i don't really relate it to the best sand and i think you know if you want sand great but do you want to want to you want to go in the water i agree yeah i mean that's it's that's the truth that's why and that's why sky likes miami because it's not a huge surfer. It's so not big into surfing, no. Yeah. So you convinced your your co-host or editor to move here. Was that difficult? That's a good question. Was that difficult, Sky? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I was. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning thirty this year, and Ian always says California is great for your twenties, and I kind of had that same realization. And you know, here I am, leading, leading the thirties in Miami. There you go, living a dream. Yeah, this guy's working with cigars.com and we're, we're building the damn good day show to the moon. And, you know, it's like we even used to talk. We had this vision and this dream and, and this goal of just connecting with outstanding people. And nothing's like being able to invite someone into your home and just be, be real with somebody. Right. And just those good things lead to great conversations and all that stuff. So I agree. I agree. Too much stuff is, is fake today. Too much stuff is like, oh, I'm going to script everything and. You know, you can't open a magazine anymore. You can't really watch it. Everything's scripted. So, yeah, it feels good. I just think that when you meet, and I'm beating this on like uh, on the head too much, but when, when I hang out with someone that is just truly awesome, I leave there just feeling really good. You know, it's way more than like if I went on a, like a super yacht or something. If I just had this awesome conversation, which is why I like cigars, because to me, a cigar is number one. You don't get hung over from a cigar, right? Because drinking just destroys me. I still do it, but I just would rather not. Over, let's say, a cigar, I'm committed to a conversation for like 45 minutes to an hour. Smoking a stove, connected, not looking at my phone as much, and I'm just in the moment and I'm vibing. I can answer a call if business hits me up. I like things that encourage just authenticity. So you, you did Harvard Business School? Yeah. What was that experience like? It was amazing. I had a great group of uh, friends and colleagues. Everyone was uh, successful already, so it was a great um, learning thing. It's not like everyone, anyone's starting from zero. Everyone's starting from a you know this level. 
so uh, that was that was great. The professors are amazing, uh, and it's it's fun. You know, everyone. You know, I had friends from Qatar, Nigeria, uh, <laughs> Japan, Australia, all over the world, and uh, you know, we try to keep a class trip going, which is which is fun. Our last one was actually in Miami. You pick different uh, destinations every year. Yeah, so we went to uh, India. The Indian group just, they crush it. They really show up. And, and you know, we went to Ireland. Um, you know, they, they introduce you to the Tishik, who is basically their prime minister. And, and you know, everything is, is very well organized and orchestrated. And, and uh, you know, uh, our next trip is to Colombia. So we're excited to see the okay. Colombian group. Um I think it's going to be Cartagena, if I recall correctly. I, uh, I have to check. It's going to be in October, I believe. Very cool. Um, but I think it's Cartagena, and, and uh, it'll be fun. You know? I lived in Medellin for six months. Oh, my goodness. It was amazing. Yeah, I'm doing a pilot with my new company in Bogota. Uh, it might be going in two weeks, so maybe you got to help, come help me. It's such a great <laughs> startup community there. It's great. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Great. It's, it's badass. Yeah, they've, got, they've had some successful exit, you know, companies that have, have been doing really well there. Uh, my nickname there was Jesus Blanco, White Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. It was cool. Did, I was cool with it. Did you learn how to dance? I did. So I had to dance because I didn't know Spanish. So I had to dance to speak. Oh, that was your language. I had to. Yeah. I, I was impressed. The first I had time to I went roll to Colombia, I saw like girls just dancing with guys. Like The coolest thing about Colombia and South America in general is that it's such a better family environment like when you go to a club there people aren't paying ten thousand dollars for a table right people are barely even sitting down they're dancing and the daughter would be there the mom would be there the grandmother would be there the whole family goes out and parties and dances and like i love that culture like i grew up in a family where you know it's just super typical like middle class white family where you have to say prayers and there's no music playing and you're just looking around so how was your day shout out mom and dad i love you but you know it just isn't the vibe compared to the latin americans it's like you're listening to straight up you know you're straight shaking chilling eating i just love the energy if you dance with a girl the mom comes after you hey you have to stay with her the grandma comes after you yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's pushing you like <laughs> oh yeah they got ride or dies you yeah, know that's that's great the family atmosphere is great do you have any siblings um so i have there's um i have one full brother one full sister there's seven kids in total for my dad's side damn all over the world yeah are you close with everyone yeah we try to we try to be close yeah not everyone you know some are in switzerland some are in brazil what was it like some growing up with that many siblings was it like a madhouse well, we didn't usually live under one roof the whole time. So, so like, I have uh, my youngest brother's 24. My, I have a sister that's 29, 30. I think she's 29. <laughs> Going, staying on 29. No. Uh, so it was mostly the three of us, my full brother and full sister, that lived together. And, and um, we all went to Switzerland together. We all uh, lived in Dallas together. And then after that, it kind of broke apart and everyone kind of went their own ways right but now it funny thing we're all here in south florida again amazing yeah such a great hub oh, so. what is the best hub because you live here six months out of the year get your no income tax and then go do whatever you want right but this is a hub florida's the spot um yeah i think i think uh everything has its timing right i think ultimately it depends on the time of your life uh but right now there's no better place for a tech entrepreneur in his young career or mid-career uh, to be the Miami. So talk to us about the first time you started your first company. I know you've done so many, but can you remember like maybe making that first jump, some of the feelings you went through and what was the impetus there? Sure. So um, my first company was a company called Phones for All and we co-branded it Telefonos Para Todos. And um, it was back in the, the uh, telecom deregulation demonopolization deregulation act of 96 and they were opening up telecom my half brother uh saw the opportunity and we created a company that was the first company licensed in all 50 states to do business we had more licenses than at&t more than anyone and so we're the only company actually licensed with a, a complete national footprint we built a dial tone company and sold uh dial tone services um prepaid to mostly Latinos or people that back then used to have to have a social security number, long distance was tied to your 
phone bill. Phones bill, bills could get ridiculous. You know, if you were a Mexican coming over the border and you asked for a phone, they'd say it's a security number. You don't have one. We need a thousand dollar deposit to get a phone in your home. This is pre cell phone days, and um, and we branded it. We had it in Seven Eleven. You know, you would go buy an activation card. Within two days, we'd have your phone connected, and you know, every month you go in and buy a monthly service card, and and that was the first business. We grew it from you know zero to about a close to a hundred million in run rate in the first year. What was that like when it comes down to just putting it together? You got your friend and said, hey, let's do this? Or what's that process like? So we started out with four brothers in an office. And uh, I think we grew to over 300 employees in the first year. So you could imagine the challenges of growth. And I mean, parking was a problem. Everything was a problem. Um, But, you know, sales didn't seem to be a problem. Right. So we hit something right. and uh, and that was it. We were growing really quickly, and 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 the company w- did well. What ended up happening? Um, we ended up selling the company to another company that was kind of the dot com bubble bust era. Um, we were the largest CLEC at that time, and uh, we sold. Uh, we sold for what we thought was a good price, but absolutely horrible. The our second, much smaller competitor sold three months later for you know, almost out of zero. Yeah. And then, you know, had we just put the word dot com behind our thing, it would have added two zeros. But, but, um, but yeah, we did okay. We did okay. I start, I kept in telecom after that and, uh, built a tech company, uh, based on problems I found in my first business. So basically like while you're going through it, you're thinking, wow, this would be a great idea for a startup. Yeah. And then when you sell, you're like, this is a great time. Let's jump in. All my companies have been problems. How do I solve a problem? And then depending on how big the problem is, is what I see as the opportunity and, and, uh, and what we're going to do. So, yeah, I, uh, I stayed in telecom and, and built a, a soft switch before the word cloud existed. And we were selling telecom services to uh, big carriers. And, uh, you know, it was it was funny time because no one we were like, well, you know, here's your product, and you know every meeting would be an RFP, and we'd re- respond to the RFP, and it would be Lucent, Nortel, us, Cisco, just constantly going against the same people. Everyone, same meeting every time. It was, you know, the four big guys, and then us, and their pitch was always the same. It's like we need you need to buy this equipment, then you need to buy this software. It's going to be six months of of integration work, and then you know it's you know two million dollars. And our pitch was very different. It's like, here you go. By the way, here's the product you requested. It's already working. You can run it today. It doesn't cost you anything, but pay me a half a cent a minute. And um, that model seemed to start working before the companies were like, oh, no, we need CapEx. We need to invest. We need the hardware. And then the, the word cloud started to appear and then realized, oh, wow, this is much better. Have it hosted we can actually run our services and we don't need the hardware and we don't need the integration worries or failures. Did it almost seem like a no brainer to you guys? You're like, yeah, we saw it clearly. And, uh, you know, the challenge was, you know, again, try to explain cloud before the word cloud existed. Like, Oh, you're going to host everything. You know, give me all your photos and put them in the cloud. What? (laughs) (laughs) You can't touch my photos, right? They're private. (laughs) You don't want to see what's on my photos. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But now you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense, right? Right. I don't have to need hardware. I don't need the storage and it's safe forever. Um, So yeah, that was a, you know, it was, you know, a little bit before our times, but we saw the, the, the value there. What do you think has been some of the other determinants that helped you win RFPs throughout your life? Beyond, like, let's say you just have two very similar services. Who do you think the prospect is going for? And, like, what are some things people can do to sort of differentiate themselves in that process? It's kind of like sales, if you would, but at the same time. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's not so easy to answer, though, because, you know, there's, you know, you ultimately have to come down to figuring out what the client needs and and be able to provide it for them. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of times I've been challenged with, you know, I'm selling against a big gorilla, right? So that's that's always been a challenge. But like, that's your thing, man. That's my thing. Until I become the gorilla, then it becomes different. But, <laughs> but the but yeah, it's like, you know, that's that's a challenge. Um, 
you know, unfortunately, a lot of times when you're dealing with some of these guys, they're very cold. It comes down to a pricing th thing. And most of the time, it's not pricing. So, um, you know, I, I'd say um, have a don't take no for an answer attitude. If you do believe, fully believe that your product is better or a good fit for them, don't let them say no. Don't let a customer say no. And take, do what it has, you have to do to get him to say yes. So, you know, sometimes the relationships are built after the sale. Sometimes the sales are cold and um, you fight through the cold and, and win their hearts and then, and then show them, oh, by the way, this is why I wanted you to try this and this and this. It's interesting. It's also interesting, like uh, in our current company I work with, um, CS is such a big deal. Um, just customer success and maintaining and, and like keeping clients happy. I feel like that's something that we didn't do as well with my first company. But the second one, it's like I see how important CS is in maintaining those relationships, which obviously the top five Fortune 500 are the best at that. You know, everyone's in bed with each other because they have deep roots connected. You know, you got to get your tree up in the roots, man. It's but you got to plant. Yeah, you got to do everything. It's tough. It's tough. And then what I was I was floored by is your recent huge success, and then you got absolutely just donkey kicked by freaking COVID. Yeah, and that's that's Chargello. That's Chargello. Yeah, what a great name, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was a tough one. It was a tough one. We uh, we were putting phone chargers in in restaurants and selling advertising on the phone chargers, and that was uh, the bottle right there basically that was it um you know it's a very simple concept um we uh we designed and built the chargers ourselves uh everything was proprietary from the cables to the devices and we uh we started deploying and and we grew pretty quickly uh ended up in 26 countries over 6000 restaurants um and pushed hard 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 um raised a lot of debt and uh, the secret to the success of that company, which people might not understand it at all, is the failure of the device. And let me explain that in, a, in another way. Um, the device will fail. And we service... Meaning your device? My device or any device in this... In, like your in iPhone the, app battery will go bad. In, these, in the environment every device will fail. And, you know, I was asked, oh, why don't you just buy Mophie's and do this and that? The devices will get stolen, the devices will break, the devices, will, they will not work. Um, so the challenge for the restaurants or the, the retailers or the events is they don't want to deal with those problems. So that's why they can't buy a solution. Uh, so the secret to my success was that I serviced every location once, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a month. So I would touch the chargers. I would come back, bring new cables. If you think your iPhone cable goes bad, imagine on a, you know, on a device that hundreds of people are using all the time. So we had to bring new cables every month, bring new new chargers. We had the images always clean for the advertiser. You know, if it said Heineken, it looked beautiful. It was a great green. If it was Visa or whoever the major brand was, uh, it was well. But the secret to the success was that we maintained the service of the place and we touched them every, all the time. They got to know you. They got to know us, they got to love us. You know, that was the secret to the, to the company's success and why it grew so well. Um, but also the, the challenge when COVID hit because, you know, now we have all this overhead, we have all these, this, these teams that need, you know, salaries and, you know, et cetera. And, and uh, unfortunately we were in multiple countries and the debt was too heavy to service. and. Just wrong, bad timing. It, you know, you can't plan for a pandemic. Yeah. I don't think any business plan should say, well, if a pandemic happens, then we're going to do this. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. Um, should it revive post-pandemic? Maybe. Is Maybe. there anything like looking back that you would have done different particularly for that? You know, you, you look back and you say, well, don't expand so fast. Maybe would have been one thing. Um, but, you know... <laughs> Had a pandemic not happened, it would have been the right move. Right. So you want to expand fast. So it's not, it's it's hard to say anything was really wrong. Um, I probably would have taken more partners instead of debt. I built a lot of debt, and I probably should have had more partners uh, on the financing side. But um, but otherwise, I think the the idea was good. Um, 
you know, we had a idea of, you know, we had just launched the New York operation. We had, we had that up to about 800, 900 locations and we were going to launch uh, LA, then Dallas, Vegas, Chicago. Um, we had major brands, uh, Diageo and, and Bacardi. And we, we dealt with all the spirit brands, all the, all the, the finance brands, all the major credit cards, and they just wanted a bigger footprint and, and uh, that was our goal, get the biggest footprint possible. Damn, I mean, you did everything right, got things <laughs> moving. How do, like, when you look at your life, how do you feel you deal with big, big problems? Whether that be your company just getting completely crushed by this unseen event called the pandemic or whether it be a health problem or whatever. Like, how do you, how does your brain work when dealing with the shit hits the fan, like the five stages of grief? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, crying about it doesn't help. M complaining about it doesn't help. You really got to turn the page and move on. You can't think about it too much. Um, past is the past. It unfortunately, you're like, shit happens. Yeah. You got to move on. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to help. You can complain to nobody, and you can cry about your story. By the way, it's not going to help. So you got to move on. Um, a lot of times in life, I feel that when you think everything is so bad, you find yourself six months, a year down the line thinking it wasn't that bad, you know, or, <laughs> you know, it's all good now, you know? Oh, no, I still cry at night. I just don't cry in front of everyone. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, you know, you know, the other way you look at it is, okay, I had the largest mobile um, phone charger company in the world. And I you could have expanded that into so many things. Too. You know, I was charging a half a million people a day. We had major brands all over the place. Uh, they still call me today, uh, clients. I mean, are you uh, thinking of like bringing it back to life or maybe is the boat missed in that sense? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Right. We'll see. I think the, I think the market still exists. People still need to charge their phones. Um, advertisers still want to touch um, customers in a positive way. Uh, so those two things still exist. Um, was getting like access to really good chargers a process in itself or was that a few phone calls? Did you have to like manufacture <laughs> your own charger? We manufactured our own charger. Cause some of the chargers suck. Like the iPhone chargers, like they're crush iPhone charger goes so fast, but some of the chargers you buy are just garbage. I will tell you that our chargers were very, very expensive. And, um, and I made it, did it on purpose. Our chargers were the best chargers you could ever get. And it's very hard for someone to build a charger uh, like Chargello because we spent money, we spent R and D, we built the fastest charger you'll ever get. You, we could compete against any charger, and they wouldn't beat us. We would be three times faster than a wall charger. Could and, you take that charger and like sell that to somebody? You know, it, the problem with that is that goes into a retail environment, and now. For me to retail it, I'm competing against Mofi, let's say many companies, right? I'm competing against many companies, and they're starting at a, you know, their cost is less than half of mine. And you're not going to understand the value because their packaging is going to say the same thing my packaging says. Their right. thing's going to, you know, they're, they're boxing it pretty. They're going to market it, et cetera. So, you know, I would have to retail it $200, $250. And you're like, I'm not going to buy a $250 charger. Uh, you know, I'd rather buy a $99 Mophie. It works yeah. great. So it doesn't work in that environment. No. Um, could I have built a cheaper charger for my environment? Probably. But when you touch people in a way that they feel it, like, wow, this charger is really good. I had some restaurants, the guy would say, listen, I have customers that come here just to charge the phone. You know, they're like, oh, I'm, I was running out of charge. I was going to go home. But I knew you had these chargers that are faster than going home. And... They charge much faster. So and they ordered a burger while they were there. They ordered a burger while they were there. Restaurant like, let's go. And the restaurant's like, this is amazing. That's a great model. So, you, you know. Probably got a lot of free meals. <laughs> <laughs> My service guy never paid for a meal anywhere. In every market, they were like the number one. I need a reservation. They were like, oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Those type of businesses where you can just build, where you're helping people too, is the like that's the best you wake up you have a positive interaction with someone it's not like look at this ass you know it's like no it's like oh it's freddy let's go what's up freddy great to see you not like oh great the tax collector's here like what are you going to take from me today 
Well, let me tell you, like selling into a restaurant is tough because, you know, you could imagine how many vendors arrive at the restaurant every day selling them something, everything from knives, forks, chairs, new, new lights, toilet paper, you know, and here they are, a new vendor. What is he selling? Chargers. Don't want to talk to him. And uh, so that's the first thing you have to do is train your, your sales team to not take no as an answer. What is, like, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Was there, like, a certain game plan there when new people would show up to a restaurant? I'll tell you it's the story of our one of our first restaurants we went to. And, and uh, you know, it was kind of funny. It was it was me and, and uh, my co-founder, Johnny. And and um, we had just received the, the, the first prototypes from China. And they were beautiful boxes. Everything was nice. And we grabbed uh, a couple boxes and we walk over to a, a restaurant in, in Coconut Grove called uh, Jaguar or Jaguar. And uh, we think this place, this will be great there. And we're, you know, talk to the guys at Hawaii and they're like, um, can, would you guys be interested in some chargers? And, and they're like, well, let me see. Talk to the manager of the bar. And the manager of the bar is like, oh, this is awesome. We really need this. The owner owns three restaurants. Go down to, um, go down to his other restaurant. And, uh, and. Uh, you got his name. You're like, great. Yeah. So we get his name. We're carrying the boxes. We're walking down to the other you got restaurant. Got a warm lead. You're like, and, let's go. Um, I'm not gonna say his name. I think it, let's just say Scott. Uh, I forget his name at this point. But you know, so here we go. We go to the restaurant. Yeah, we're here to see Scott. It's like, do you have an appointment? It's like, no, we don't have an appointment. Um, okay, you can't see Scott without an appointment. We're like, okay, well, can we make an appointment? Okay, come tomorrow at two o'clock. Great. So pack your things, take a bite, come back the next day, two o'clock. Yeah, we're here to see Scott. You have an appointment? Yes, we have an appointment at 2 o'clock. Okay, great. S- sit on there. I was like, great. We're there. We're waiting. It's 3 o'clock. Scott doesn't come out. And we're like, damn it. Um, can you guys come back tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> Fine. Here we go. Next day, 2 o'clock. We're here to see Scott. Waiting about 20 minutes. Scott doesn't come out. But the manager comes out. And uh, the manager's Nicaraguan. Johnny's Nicaraguan. Perfect. We got this. And the guy chastises us for an hour of why they hate phones and how they hate charging people's phones. And it's a disaster. And we're like, man, this is going. Oh, because they're relating it to people saying, hey, can you charge my phone real quick? And they're like. Or people not talking to the waiter or not enjoy the amount of money they spent on decor and people don't care because they're on their phones. Well, we were like, wow, maybe this is not such a good idea. And then, uh, <laughs> whatever we gave up on them. We start installing in other places, other places, other places. Um, fast forward, there's a lot of churn in the restaurant business. Mm. Uh, one of the biggest benefits to us was the churn because if you worked in a restaurant that had Chargello, the first thing you do when you get to the new restaurant is install Chargello because you already know it's free. You already know the customers are tipping better, having happier customers. Everything's better. So one of the bar managers from another restaurant now works at Jaguar. The first thing he does is he calls him to install Chargello. Now we're in Jaguar. And uh, at that moment, we were probably in about 150 locations, maybe a little bit more. But I would always do auditing. I would always go and try and ask for the charger, make sure they're giving it right and things like that. So I go there for lunch one day, and and um, a friend of mine is there in front of me. And I'm, he, I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm doing restaurant reviews for TripAdvisor. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, he's like, what are you doing? I'm putting phone chargers in restaurants. So <laughs> That's a great he's pitch. like, my phone is dying. I knew this guy was important, by the way, because Scott is his waiter. The owner of the whole thing is this guy's waiter because he wants to make sure that TripAdvisor gives him a great review. Right. Yeah, schmoozing him. So here he is. He asks for a phone charger. He's charging his phone. Everything's going great. He falls in love with it, tells Scott how amazing the chargers are. And uh, to Scott, whatever he leaves, I walk outside and Scott chases me (laughs) and he couldn't even speak. He's like, I need 
the phone chargers in my other restaurants. I'm like, yeah, no problem, Scott. I'll install it today. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an amazing story. You know, just kept going, but ultimately just provide service and it, it worked, you know, believe in your product. And, and eventually I got in all their restaurants and, and of course they ended up loving us. I love that business model. It's so simple. It was so simple. Like, and then like you didn't create a demand. The demand's there. It's oh, like, yeah. you're, you're like a gas station for phones. Well, we learned how to sell after, right? So before we'd go in, Hey, uh, do you guys need some phone? Char-? Like, then we learned that, you know, you walk in and say, Hey, do people ever ask for phone chargers? And if they say no, they're lying, but you know, no, no one ever asked for a phone charger course they do yes they ask for a phone charger well what are you doing to solve it nothing well we have this company that's supported by advertising you don't have to pay anything we're going to come in and we service it and by the way we're in every single other restaurant so you know we had like you know the most high-end restaurants from you know prime 112 to to you know we had alan ducasse put him in all his restaurants in Paris, in france so you know when i when people would say oh no we're too good for them I'm like well alan ducasse has him in all his restaurants i show him a picture of alan ducasse and I'm like holy cow maybe we're not that high end <laughs> so it was great it's so interesting the uh the, the effect you get when you know that other people are doing it right once you realize that you're the odd man out it's like getting that that initial just market you know penetration to get your stuff seen get the flagship client and we even experienced that when we first got our first partnership with Ally Quinta or with the UFC um, Ally Quinta he's awesome we went five rounds with Habib legend and then eventually that helped lead to our partnership with the PGA golfer and that helped lead to our big thing with Folds of Honor which is they have 60 chapters they donate money to uh, the charities of uh, on behalf of fallen soldiers and we see that roller coaster effect it's like you use you use your inertia to get the one guy, to get the next, to get the next, to get the next. And then it's just relationships, service, delivering on time, and being true to your word. That's it. Deliver a good product. But yeah, it's it's that first sale is difficult, for sure. Yeah, and that's where people get... That, that's why you got to play the game. You got to play the game. You know? It's, Listen, uh, Freddie, I need you to go up to that restaurant owner right now. And I need you to tell him and ask him if he has a charger. If not, you're buying everyone some Dunkin' D's. That was our that was our game every day. And by the way, you can't take no for an answer. And that's like the best when you're just with the boys. You're built trying to do something. You're on a mission, and and then you get that post beer at the end of the day where you, when you did it, you're like, let's go. Like I accomplished something today. I overcame my fear. And it's even more awesome when cool shit happens because of it. Because you went to that event, you met this person, and that person ended up changing your life forever. And it would have never happened had you not made that conversation. It's crazy. It's really wild. It's really wild. And you got to get out there, otherwise it's not going to happen. That's the lesson for everyone. Like You need to take chances. You need to. Because who loses if you don't take the chance? Yeah, no one, the chance is not going to come get you. What ripple effect down the road is not going to happen? So it's like say yes to new experiences, you know, for sure. All the time. Just try not to like die in the process, you know, maybe do some (laughs) risk mitigation, but mostly say yes, you know, in a smart way. And you were talking about me, a a recent thing you were building. And that was the, for, let me know if I get it right. It's almost like a smart cubby for door dashers to be able to pick things up on the fly, on the go, to just streamline that whole process. An IoT device, is that correct? You're right, yeah. So I've been building this device that, um, basically it's an IoT device that, that notifies of order readiness and where to pick it up, streamlines um, the process and, and you know automates a lot of manual processes, keeps it simple and dumb for you know, let's call it the, the, the simpleness of it is important. Uh, but yeah, we're doing, we're doing interesting pilots right now with that. And, um, and they're going really well. We're saving a lot of time. And uh, ultimately, it's a financial model. It's, it's a convenience model on one side, but it's really a financial play for these guys because we can remove the downtime for the driver. And by removing the downtime for the driver, we can actually... Um, allow him to make more deliveries per hour which gives him more money you can reduce the fee you pay him per hour by still increasing his hourly rage and you can be successful so right now all these companies are losing money um, because they don't have a financial model that works they have to pay the driver a minimum amount because the driver can't work for less they have to 
take so much that's from how the, the DoorDash restaurant. model works like if i pay 25 dollars for food and then it's like you have that tip you add on they're also getting paid directly from the restaurant I, I break it down completely, but yeah, they're taking, you know, a certain percentage from the restaurant. The restaurant's taking a certain percentage. Um, you know, all in all, everyone's kind of losing money. The driver's taking a percentage of that. Um, and then there's a tip on top of that. Um, but no matter what you do, they're all losing money. You can look at their financials right now. They're all getting hit. Um, you know, they all grow by, by acquisition and, and a continual growth in market share. Uh, but you break it down to it. They're losing money per transaction. And the only way to improve that is, is efficiencies. And uh, that's really what I do. I love it. Your brain thinks so simple. You don't think of building, you know, an iPhone. You just think of charging it, you know, you, you don't think of, you know, having to build the latest and greatest app. You're just like, no, I'm just going to make you get your food a little bit quicker. You know, well, it all spawns off of like needs, right? My phone was always dying and, I needed to charge my phone everywhere I went. And I was like, well, why don't I put a phone charger everywhere we go? And that's how the charger was born. <laughs> that's a great, and, that's a great know, line. You know, you order food and it takes an hour. It's like, why doesn't it take 30 minutes? Like, I know I can order from McDonald's and go pick it up very quickly. Right. It shouldn't take the driver a lot longer than me going to do it myself. And so that's where this, this idea kind of spawned off. And the idea is, you know, you got to, take away where the you know the bottlenecks are and that's it uh, there's definitely a bottleneck in pickup there's a bottleneck in parking there's a bottleneck in in uh, you know uh, organization yeah and people get so pissed if you order food and it's not hot i mean for good reason right but like first of all there's some food that you order on doordash you just can't order on doordash like for example you can't order a burger on doordash you need to eat a burger fresh and hot off the fries grill. fries are always like soggy and cold it's yeah. horrible it's horrible you can't do that you can't order a taco on doordash it's a rookie move what you can order on doordash sushi oh yeah pokey that's about yeah you exactly know? Stick, ramen stick ramen, to, the, stick to the the basics stick to the things that work really well on delivery and you'll be way happier yeah so you know there's there's still a lot of movement in that industry that needs to happen. Um, the The good thing is there's a lot of money in the industry, um, so I'm a, I'm in a good place right now, um, just proving that it works and and that you know I can I can make it more. Do simple. you feel that you're more of like a like on the business side of, of ops, or are you more on like the building side and getting things together? How would you kind of describe yourself? Are you the CTO? Or are you the are you the CEO? Like how do you roll? How do you operate? Um, I mean, I, what are your strengths there? I guess I'm, my biggest strength is identifying opportunity and then, you know, building the idea. That's probably my biggest strength. Um, you know, ultimately, a company gets to a certain size, everything changes. Yeah. I'm not that excited about a company when you don't know everyone's name and you don't really mean that much and everything kind of becomes every day the same thing. Um, so that's where I, you know, I definitely want to exit before that happens um but you know i enjoy the the idea and this is a need and let me figure out how Bring to fix to this need and let's make it live yeah well, what keeps you up at night um <laughs> be anything <laughs> i mean every every it's a you know startups are challenging hardware is challenging um you know when you're when you're starting out um obviously you have so many different things that you worry about yeah um you have to perform you know you're gonna have problems that happen no matter what they're gonna happen it doesn't matter how good you think you built your tech or you built your software or you built your hardware or you built anything problems are gonna happen and and so i think i've matured enough to understand that no matter what things are gonna happen how fast can you fix them how fast can you get past that and keep the relationship with the client right the customer yeah. so that he understands that, oh by the way Sure. Never burn a bridge. It's horrible. It's a disaster. But he's fixing it. He's working on it. He's he's dealing with it. Yeah. You know. So that's the most important thing. I feel like there's a good tip just for anyone that whenever you have a customer that hits you up and asks you a question and you don't know the answer, your first thought is I have to go find the answer and then respond to them once I have the answer. But you should always just message them right away saying, "Hey, I saw your question. I just want to let you know that I will have an answer to you by X." It doesn't keep them like waiting. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's like a little it, touch point that just shows like, hey, like, 
I hear you are heard versus just going ghosting for two or three days. You disagree? I don't know. It depends on the client. I, I honestly, you know, go the other route. There might be clients that you want to cut off, right? So there's clients that are going to be so demanding of you that they, they, they ask you questions that are ridiculous or they ask you for things or, or changes or moves that don't make sense for your overall business. And so, you know, trying to satisfy everyone doesn't work. Right. And so, um, you know, look at Google, you know, try to send them a problem or a question. Look at Uber, try to send them that you have a problem or a question, you know, <laughs> good luck getting an answer. It's right. So, terrible. so it, it's not that they don't have the ability to do that. Um, it's that they're, you know, they can't focus on, on, on that individual problem. So, you know, the answer would be in general, probably yes. Right. Um, but on a case by case basis, I would say, um, it opens up the door to what's called a toxic client. And I would be worried about toxic clients and, and don't be afraid to lose a toxic client. Right. Toxic client brings down the mojo of the whole squad. Brings down the mojo. You're going to waste 80% of your time on toxic clients. That's not going to bring you 80% of your business. And, uh, and yeah, it's sometimes it doesn't help the herd. You know, it doesn't help the rest of the clients. It just yeah. helps that one client. Like when you sort of audit your life, what are maybe some of the things that you find has increased your productivity and it really kind of like, uh, what are some of your personal habits? Like, are you the type of dude that cranks a to do list or are you just like, how do you organize your life to be productive? No to do lists. I just, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I try to keep a calendar and schedule of, of meetings and things like that, but, um, I, I, uh, I try to stay, you know, balance a little bit of life and business. Yeah. Um, you know, and you seem to have that really well down, you know, because I, I think because I'm calmer, I think I was less calm before. I think I matured into that. So now I'm, I understand there takes time to build things. I understand that it takes time for issues to resolve. So, you know, before I would be, you know, very on top and going uh, nuts and end of the world, fire, everything. Yeah, like strung out. Kind yeah. Of like. And I think I, I learned to relax over time that, you know, problems are going to happen. If, you can solve them. If you're consistent, them. if you do the right thing, eventually it's going to all turn around. You'll fix it as long as it's not a, you know, catastrophic problem, you know. And it's even just like how your mojo, but even just conversations and meeting people, it's like, yeah, you know, this is what I do. Because one thing you do really well is, is pitch. You pitch all the time. Like I saw you at the event and you were just pitching. You're like, check this out. Oh yeah, I'm working on this new IoT device. Oh yeah, check it out here, check it out. Check it out. Oh, did you do that? Oh, how's it going, Bill? Oh, here, check out this, you know? And you're just, you're, you're constantly doing these testing, which I think is such a great idea of just being at these conferences and just pitching it as many people as possible, what they, how they react, you know? It's, it's good to get feedback. Um, it's also bad to get feedback. So yeah, it's, it's, it's be depressing if it's bad feedback. <laughs> no, no, I honestly don't think you should ever listen to anyone. It sounds weird, but it's, um, it makes a, a, it's a typical mistake is listening to too much feedback. And, uh, I think most people would do better if they just had their KPIs and their KPIs should always move and KPIs go in different stages, stage, the stage of your company should have a certain KPIs and focus on that, not on feedback. Um, and then move those KPIs and then you could shift the KPIs after, after the company matures a little more and then shift the KPIs some more. And I think that's really the key. Don't listen to really, uh, you know, your, your good friends and your enemies might say, Oh, that's amazing. That's great. And, uh, that's not going to help you by the way. Right. And then maybe your friends will tell you, Oh, that's horrible. Or I have this, that's not going to help you. Uh, you know, your friend can say, oh, what if it did this? What if it did that? What if it did this? It might not help you. It might all distract you. Um, so I think if you didn't listen to anyone and focused on building the right KPIs and worked off those measurements, you know, with Chargello, I had 100 million problems. And all I really cared about were, are the customers happy? <laughs> are we growing in the number of locations? And are the advertisers happy? And that's all I cared about. Not that, oh, the guys are complaining that the cables are bad or the kind of, all that was noise to me. Or these guys needed more, or the pricing, or the, none of that mattered. Um, can we make it smaller? Can we make it bigger? Can we get wireless charging? Can we do this? Do you take like the idea of like running experience, uh, experiments, right? So do you, some, one of my good friends, Dan Hunt, 
Uh, I just, I love him to death. He's just been this like super awesome mentor in my life. And he says like all he focuses on is just running little micro experiments to constantly be learning so that there's no really such thing as failing. It's just failing and conducting the experiment and seeing like, did this work? Did this not work? What could I have done better? And constantly keeping like an air table open of all the different experiments you're running. And over time you eventually find what works as long as you're just continuously testing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so then that, that, but how do you measure the results is the key. Like don't measure the results by opinions of others. Measure the results by fact or actual, you know, don't measure. Oh, don't listen to the, the smart guy that, oh, this guy told me, you know, the charger yeah. has to be, you know, cheaper or don't, don't, don't listen to the smart guy. Listen to your gut and listen to, don't listen to anyone. Actually, don't even listen to your gut. Just set your KPIs, measure it, and then see if it's moving in the right direction. What's your favorite brunch spot in Miami? Oh, wow. Uh, I have a lot. Like Sunday brunches? Yeah, Sunday brunch. You're, you're a little hungover from the night before. You slept in a little bit later than you're used to. You know, Miami's got a lot of new restaurants and stuff like that. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of on-the-water stuff. Uh, Smith & Walensky, one of my favorites. Uh, definitely a, a, a go-to. Yeah. Uh, Garcia's, if you've ever been there. Awesome. Garcia's. Garcia's. I love V Bistro. They're awesome. Oh yeah. They're in Frickle and Coral Gables. Oh sure. Bakery and Daniel Bistro. is the is the director there. He's he was on the podcast. He's awesome. He had my chargers. He was he was a great spot. Yeah. Oh really? Oh yeah. So, They're best, always booked, man. Best croissants in town. So good. So good. So good. You're not fat. How many times do you go there? I know. I need to. I gotta fix. I gotta fix. I gotta fix this gut. I get this gut in line. I'm drinking a freaking elemental diet. For people that listen to the show, they know I've been talking to them on this elemental diet. I'm on day 11 right now of the elemental diet. I've drinking nothing but elemental diet every day for 11 days. Okay. So when people talk about willpower. You don't do that shit unless you have to do it, right? It's not something I choose to do. But the good thing is, is that ultimately it's, it's helping me. It's healing my gut and I have a plan. And the big thing is, is whenever you have health issues, you need to have a plan, right? If you don't, health issues swallow you up and eat your soul. And you just feel bad and sorry for yourself. But everyone here right now has an issue in their life, right? And instead of just complaining about it, getting sad about it, put together a plan, whether it be Eastern, Western medicine, find something that you're doing that hopefully in the future will be a better result. And you'll not think about it because you know that there's a possibility that it's going to get better. You know, how I found that helped so much. How do you measure your results? Um, am I taking normal poops? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But Am I it, gaining weight? I'm giving you like, this is the same thing to the business, yeah. right? Don't listen to anyone's diet advice, right? How many people give you diet advice? Oh, yeah. How crazy. many amazing, by the way, there's experts and this and that and the when other. You eat blueberries, bro. You're going to turn into a straight V. Like, uh, it's, it's not the case. I don't know. Sometimes there you go, right? But now you did your own thing. You know, you're going to see if your poop's great or not. Oh, yeah. That's and if huge... it works, great. 100%. If it doesn't, you'll try something else. That's that's it. I'm doing this gallbladder cleanse after this. <laughs> Literally, it's two weeks of elemental diet followed by an, a gallbladder cleanse. Because I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to get like, if it doesn't work, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to get my gallbladder removed, which is okay in America. It's one of the most common surgeries. I'm trying not to do that. Obviously, I don't want to have an organ removed, but we'll see. You don't die from it. That's for sure. That's that's important. You know, you, gotta, <laughs> you just you gotta be on like a low fat <laughs> diet, but. I will say like throughout those health challenges, you learn that like whenever you think life's crazy, it's typically not at the end. You, when you get through hard times, it makes you a more empathetic person, it makes oh, yeah. you appreciate life more. And like I pimp damn good day, but like I believe it. Like it's literally, I when I like when I say it's a damn good day to have a damn good day, like it's a fucking damn good day because. That's it, That's a, you, you feel know? it. Otherwise it wouldn't work by the way. Right. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Yeah, you know, it's great. It's like there's so much good things right now to just be stoked about. I mean, if you go outside and you just look at a great flower, you're like, yo, that flower is nice. That's a nice looking flower, right? But you can get stoked on an animal. You can get stoked on some art. You can get stoked on the water. Find something that gets you stoked. If you don't have hobbies, that's what probably makes you a boring person. Or like if you're saying, I don't have a lot of friends, do things where you find friends. You know, be social. Push yourself out there. All of those things just lead to cooler experiences. I think podcasting is the biggest life hack ever. 
because if you can build more and meet more genuine people, you broaden your horizon of how you think about shit, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Great platform. And uh, way faster than learning yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They say it's hard to appreciate things until you lose it, right? That things that make me stoked are mangoes, manatees. Another reason why Florida's great. We don't deserve manatees. Manatees are, are funny. I used to, I used to like have friends that would come here and they didn't know what manatees are. And I have a huge sign that says warning manatees. And most of my friends were foreigners. So I would tell them, be careful. It's so cool that you have that like network of foreign friends. Oh yeah. I went through 500 startups in accelerator and SF with Trueface back in the day, just me and the two founders. Yeah. And it was 36, um, startups from 18 different countries. And there was like a different country would be celebrated every week. And the, we drink different types of beer. That's so cool. And it's just so cool, man. Like that's so cool. Your guard's so down when people from other countries, cause you're just like people. I would, I would lie to my friends and they like I had Swedish girls. Like what is, I say, be very careful getting in the water because there's a manatee. What? What's that? It's like manatee, man eater, manatee. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then I would actually get them to see a manatee and they would laugh at me and hit me and different things. Yeah, a straight sea cow, man. They, they want nothing. They're so gentle. They're just chilling. Gentle they're just trying to take. They're just trying to eat some kelp, you know? Big, big when you see them first time. Like, yeah, they're, they're not like a mula mula. You're, you know those things? The sunfish? Oh, yeah, I know. Sunfish, they literally survive just by just getting as big and fat as humanly possible. And they just float around basically like a jellyfish. And people don't F with them. Well, people are animals because they're so big. Yeah, just they're oversized. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that works in America, though. You got to gotta hold it down. Yeah. Actually, I don't know. It might be. You, you might. There's probably some perks. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, uh, if you could go back in time, and this is like a staple I love to ask everyone, is if you could go back in time and look at your life, maybe right before you went to business school, and you could have said to yourself, one, two, or three things, you know, current you to younger you. You did a bunch of mushrooms. You're like, yo, this is real, man. One, two, or three things that could have saved you a ton of time, money, headache, heartache, tears, stress. And obviously, one of the best answers is I wouldn't have said anything because it made me who I am today. But let's not do that. What are some of those things that you would have told a younger you? Yeah, I think... Um I would say buy Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's, you know, I would have told myself the lottery numbers. No, um, <laughs> the, no, you got one more. <laughs> the, um, so I would have said time, don't waste too much time on certain things. And, um, time wasted could be two different things. So in my first company, uh, or my second company, I was successful, but I spent too much time in it. Meaning after five years, we pretty much locked in all the clients. And then I spent about six more years just kind of milking and m managing the same clients, the same thing. By the way, sold the company, it still got the same customers, same clients, does well, but my time was not valuable. And I wasn't enjoying myself at that period of the company. Um, so I probably wasted six years of, I could have started something else and been having more fun um, doing what I enjoy, which is the startup side. So I would say time, um, don't waste time on, on, on uh, you know, growing or, or even success or comfort. Um, and, and uh, you know, time is valuable. That's all we got, baby. That's all we and got. This is a damn good time today. Yeah. We got to get Freddie on the routine coming back. Man. Yeah, you got to become a routine Freddie, guest. I would love it. to have you on. Um, Miami like, local. And we got the two mics too, so we can bring on some like super all-stars. We'll get Serena Williams in here. Freddie uh, will just be grilling. Yeah, a good friend. Good, a good. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, friends with a good friend of mine from, from L.A. One degree of separation. Usually, something like that. That is crazy. I love that rule, though, that literally you can get in touch with anyone if you truly wanted to. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to, you know, like you said, networking, being a good person. You know, there's people you don't want to introduce people to, but then there's people you right. want to introduce everyone to. And you want to be on the ladder. <laughs> I know you're, um, you, you know, Peter. That's one thing. We're oh, yeah. I'm yeah. going to a Peter's Lake House in, uh, oh, for beautiful. his music festival. He's got a killer. Up. It's not a, I don't even 
it's it's huge, huge. I saw pictures from his last year's. 30,000 people or something like that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge stage. Yeah, it's, just, it's just such an interesting thing to have a music festival. I think know? he had Pitbull at his house, or I guess his festival. Not Pitbull. Um, uh, he had some, who did he have? He had some people. He had some wild stars. Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw. Like, Tim McGraw oh, yeah, was at his house. More country. They're, they're yeah. boys. Yeah. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's interesting that uh, good people attract good people. It's just a life lesson. Good intentions attract good good things, good energy, damn good day show, man. All about it. Making moves. Freddie, you have been like the definition of the ideal guest we'd love to have on the show. You went through adversity. You know, all these different languages, you show up, you smile, you laugh, you don't take life too seriously yet. You get shit done and you have fun. So man, we appreciate you and we look forward to having you again. And where can people follow you if they want to learn more or or maybe even hear more content or is that your thing? (laughs) On the damn good day show. <laughs> there it is. You heard it first, folks. Damn good day. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, you know, with my new business, I, I learned that I don't really need, if your name's Uber or Grubhub or DoorDash, contact me. Otherwise, <laughs> I hear that. I don't, I don't need too many clients. Um, but uh, yeah, and on other businesses, I'm, my door's open. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, I'm on, uh, Instagram or whatever, you can always look me up. And, so if you uh, have a crazy ex-girlfriend, she's going to make her name DoorDash and hit you up. Oh, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Got me again, girl. <laughs> gave, awesome. her the, gave her the door. <laughs> Appreciate you, brother. Until next time. Thank you, man.